lot on the media and that causes no end of problems, um, mostly because the far right don't like what I have to say, but c'est la vie. Um, but also I talk in courts, and I talk in courtrooms across the United Kingdom, whether that's in London or Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, Bradford, Birmingham, different courtrooms. And we sit and we talk in prisons and we talk in asylum seeker centres. Um, we seek in... And we speak in all these different places, and yet when I hear their stories and they tell me about their lives, it's kind of different seeing it from the other side. Because I'm seeing them in these formal settings, where people want to tell me their stories partly because they want me to believe. They want you to believe, and they want to present a side of their lives that we don't often hear about in the prisons, or that we don't hear about in the media. And it's kind of my job to reflect a little bit on that and reflect on the academic knowledge and put the two things together and see what we come up with. And what's really interesting about the presentation, the film here is the kind of the raw side of this, the family life. And that makes me think a lot about the framework in which I approach some of the work that I do. And I think some of you might have been startled about the lack of reference to religion. It's not until the end where we start hearing more from the family where they're saying, well, if you'd be more religious, if you put more faith in God, then maybe these things would work out all right. Because so much of the narrative that we hear is about religion as belief. That if you believe the right things, or if you have believed the wrong things, then God will either be with you or against you. And more precisely, that it is God that inspires you to do X, Y, and Z. But in the story that we've heard, and often in the cases that I've referred to, there's not that much reference to God. There's not that much reference to belief. And that can be surprising. Because when we hear the stories and the narratives and the videos of organizations and the propaganda that they put out, there is so much of religion as belief. And I think that's something that we sometimes forget. That yes, religion is partly about belief, but it is also something more than that. And I think when we look a bit deeper in this film and from the stories as well and from my own research, the other parts that we find about the role of religion is that it's also about belonging. It's about identity. It's about the groups that you identify with. It's about who's inside your group and who's outside of it. So for the protagonist here, what we're seeing is you know, the initial idea that he didn't know how to belong in Somalia. It wasn't how he belonged. He didn't understand the rules of culture and clan. And yet he was religious. Religion had helped him in prison belong. But it had also done a third part. Religion had helped give him behaviours, sets of behaviours, ways of practising belief. And I think, again, that's really important. And some of the stories that we hear around religion is it gives you structure, gives you a set of ways of being that embody who you are. And again, we see that in the film, this idea, well, if I prayed five times a day, then it would be OK. If I prayed in the mosque or grew a beard, it's that way of embodying who you are and your religion as part of that. But again, so many of our narratives around radicalization and a lot of the literature that you'll read or the stuff that you hear on the news just focuses so much on this idea of religion as belief, as if it stands apart from human lives and human stories. And what's really important about this film and what the directors have done so well is bring together that kind of abstract notion of what religion might be with those everyday real life stories about belonging and about the behaviours. And the other thing that crossed my mind watching this, and it's kind of a, an interesting thing, is that um, how many of you can spot a terrorist? <laughs> What's something that was crossing my mind? It was like, yeah, we have these ideas of who a terrorist is. And you know, we think about that in popular culture, and it's like the evil, evil villain stroking their cat, right? It's your James Bond villain. They're mad-eyed and bug-eyed and they kind of look a bit scary. And we would really, really like them to be like that. Because if they're so scary and so different from us, then we don't have to reflect on our own behaviours either. Right? So if the evil villain is someone that you can spot, maybe, I don't know, at the airport, which probably can't, um, because most of us actually look just like the terrorists at the airport. I don't know about you, but I'm usually quite stressed. Um, I'm usually anxious about the flight, my heart rate's going through the roof, and I'm just wondering whether they notice how many uh, visa stamps I may or may not have to terrorist destinations in my passport, and whether they actually look at the book that's in my bag that's usually got jihad written all over it. 
But the difference between me and the people here is I'm white, I speak posh, um, have a very sound English passport that no one ever questions, and I'm female. And I think those are really important things, that I can walk through the passport control office, I can walk into the British Embassy and I have rights and privileges that are there as an accident of birth and an accident of gender. And those things play through. And I actually think it's quite telling that his mother was willing to work towards getting a passport for his niece, but found it much harder to do so for him. And I think our ideas about what does it mean to be a woman in these spaces and what does it mean to be a man is really important. These are not just um, ideas of who is a jihadi bride either. And again, this story here challenges that, right? So thinking today um, about the recent press about whether we can have a jihadi baby, um, I think that's really interesting as a concept, whether a baby can be a jihadist or not. What kind of agency are we giving a toddler or a <laughs> newborn? I'm, I'm not too sure. And I think it's also really important, as I make that slightly uh, blasé remark, that we remember the fundamental obligations that we have as a society, as a legal system, to international human rights. And that includes the rights of the child, that includes women's rights, and that includes the rights of all human beings. And sometimes I get criticized for that. And they say to me, but, but Catherine, that, that man there was a terrorist. How, how could that person have rights? They've been complicit in the violence. They've been complicit in the terror that other people have faced. And they say, but, but what about the victims? How can you just say that this person deserves rights? And I would say that the response that we have back is, and again, here is this idea that what makes us stronger is our sense of belonging, our behaviors, our shared humanity, and our sense of beliefs in that humanity that terrorists would rather we didn't have. They wish to undermine our faith in each other. And I think what was also really telling in that was that kind of shared humanity, those everyday spaces, that notion of wanting to belong and having a family. So therein lies the, the second question around, uh, if we're thinking about the three things around religion, belief, behavior, and belonging. Um, sometimes some of the most mundane stories about, are about how you ended up a terrorist. If you ask somebody, um, and sometimes I want to do, why did you become a terrorist? And they say, well, Catholics, because of God, or religion, or politics, some grand ideology, it doesn't really matter. They will tell you the most amazing story about how they ended up in this organization. And the reason they'll tell you that story is because they've given up so much in order to invest in this new life. Right? They want this new story, this new belief, this new way of belonging, this behavior to have meant something. It's got to be a grand story, otherwise why would you have done something or participated or joined in something that could have caused the death and destruction of a city or of people? But you can ask a different question. The other question you can ask is, well, how did you end up joining Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, ISIS, and here in the past, um, various other anarchist organizations or an environmentalist group? How, how did you end up here? And those are the stories that are really quite mundane. They're really quite boring. Um, they're often the stories, so often they're about food. Um, they're really kind of like food orientated. So I, I can think of a couple of stories of young women who will tell me that uh, the reason they ended up joining or supporting various groups was not necessarily because they belonged or they identified or they believed, but actually because this was the one group where on a Wednesday afternoon they could get together and there'd be free childcare. Um, and there'd be food around, and that was nice, and they were bored. And the same actually with young men. Uh, young men would say they'd be after school, there wasn't much going on, and they, they knew kind of that they probably shouldn't sit and listen to this bloke, but you know what, he was going to buy, uh, buy the KFC for you that night, and it's a bit more fun, and you'd hang out, and yeah, you'd have to listen to the guy talk on and drone on about the stuff. But it's actually those mundane things about belonging and behavior as much as it's about belief in the cause. And what's interesting about this video, again, is we don't hear what it is that al Shabaab are after. That's not really the purpose. That's not why individuals join. And so sometimes I think, again, it's really important that we differentiate between why individuals might join a particular organization versus why does that organization exist? Those are two different things. And we so often conflate the two things. Why does Al-Shabaab exist has very little to do 
with why did the young man join and why did his wife stick with him or not, right? They're two distinct things, but so often they get kind of smashed together. And I thought that was really, really interesting in this, that actually the focus is very much on those every day and on the mundane. And the other thing that I think was really interesting was the tensions around what does it mean to be a man in this space? What is a good man? What does it mean to be an ex al Shabab? How do you behave and be manly in this space? Especially in a space where to be a man, to be masculine, to be a hero, to be a lost warrior, or to be a warrior means violence. How do you present alternative forms of belonging, of being in your behaviors that don't rely on that violence, don't perpetuate it? And you can see his struggle in those everyday things where he walks away from the arguments, but yet he wants to face them. And I think that's something that's actually quite brave, is to be able to walk away from violence in a society and in a space where violence is common. And that is probably where most of my thoughts kind of reside, is how do we deal with violence in this space? What does it mean to be a man in this space? And how can we, as a society, help young men in this society figure out what does it mean to be a man here that doesn't necessarily result in violence as well? And what are those connections? Um, thank you very much for listening to me rabbit on. Yeah, they're cool to open up the floor. So we've got about uh, 20, 25 minutes for questions, thoughts, responses. We'd love to hear from all of you. You want to start? Yeah, um, yeah he got those two years, but, but I think the, the, I'm not deeply into the, the legal parts here in the, in, in the UK, but he got deported because he didn't have a citizenship, he didn't have the passport. But they haven't given him that. No. Years. And, and the, the story is actually that he came to Britain with his two older stepsisters, as you also hear in the film, uh, and they were, they were big teenagers. They, they had the responsibility for this, for this kid, and they applied for citizenships, but they didn't write his name on the application. And he has actually never really forgiven them for that because he thinks that most of his problems relate to that they couldn't take care of him. So, so as you probably noticed, there's a lot of family drama here. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, un, um, unrecognized anger, uh, you could call it trauma in the family, that is not really uh, worked through for him or for his family. Um, and, the, and I think that's one of the reasons that he is, he, he is uh, he's confused, he's angry, and he, and he works hard to, to control that, that anger. And, and, and as you see, sometimes he cannot control, he cannot control it. Nothing is, that, nothing is scripted at all. Yeah, because that, that gave the power, the power of him from, from me because it was coming from within the soul. Almost. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. The, the method we used was that we, we decided we didn't want classic interviews. Uh, because that's that, obviously that's a, a fairly easy way to, to to move the story on, but we didn't want that. We wanted to to uh, make the whole film like uh, played out in scenes, mm -hmm. and sometimes you have to help that on the way. So what we did was bring people together and and say, could you please talk about um, what happened uh, at that particular time, or how do you feel about what happened at that particular time, and then we. We left them alone. We just filmed, and we filmed for for long, long periods of time uh, to make them relax and make them kind of forget the the camera. But nothing was scripted, and nothing was uh, like st st studied for them. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> but but uh, but it's yeah. And if it's any consolation, it would be the same in Denmark. <laughs> I think it, sorry, it relates to Catherine's <clears throat> point as well, that if, are we calling babies now, jihadi babies? You know, at what point can we say that responsibility begins? You know, can you really say someone who's a child or a, a baby well, is responsible? If you don't want them to be alienated, then you shouldn't alienate them. Mm. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, <clears throat> Because uh, I started this one, about, I started since 2010, and was, for me it was like, like <coughs> my own friend is going to Somalia and make suicide bomb. And first time I heard it. And that's why I think about 
why my community doing this and why they going my friend I playing with uh, uh, football uh, and playing and going with them with clubs and they going to Somalia and fight and they don't know the culture they don't know the religion even they come when they come in Denmark was there was one years or, or they born there in, in Denmark so for me it was like how are these young people going there and these ladies and when I got there and I find out it was like uh, because in Somalia, it's been civil war since 1991. And if you look about the grown up people, the old generation, the only thing they think about is, oh, it's God's destiny. It's uh, all it's God's will, or it's an easy way to come because everybody's traumatized. And the young people who grow up in the Western country, they need about like, uh, it's my wish, I want to do something in my country, I want to die for my country and my religious and it's different way. But sometimes I think about this young people, it's more religious in the older generation. It's opposite. Mm. It's co coincidence because uh, he was the uh, first mo movie we make, a documentary we make, it's called Warrior from the North. And I started that one in 2010, and I finished it in 2014. And I met Mohammed, was, I was looking after the young people from not m most of them Europe, but most come from Scandinavian. And I'm making up, but that's why we call warrior from the north. And these young people, I follow them was, the young people, I know them in Denmark, and I grew up with them, and I, I have the same feeling sometimes, because there was been hatred in Denmark, discrimination about Somalian people, very bad. And at the same time, it was uh, Ethiopia who was invited in Somalia, and was Christian country who invited our country, and they're using all this way. And it was, in Denmark was Mohammed Karton, if you remember that. So more people, uh, uh, Somalian people or Muslim young people, they're being like radicalized uh, somehow, and even the politician is radicalized in Denmark somehow because they always call about them and us, and you don't feel about learning about society. You feel like you, everything you do is nothing. So I met Muhammad 2013, and he was uh, like a two minute or one and a half minute uh, the previous one. Mm -hmm. Where well, he said, I want, to, I, don't, I want to live up with Al Shabaab that time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to, if I, can, if I can just add also to the things that, that you said, Catherine. Uh, I think I really appreciate that because what we have tried to do is to, is to uh, embrace the complexity of the radicalization. Because we, the first film we did, Warriors from the North, well, from the North, was very more general, and it, it was more about the the recruitment process. What 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 uh, motivated these young men to to uh, to join Al Shabaab, and and it was with tragic consequences. Um, and in this film with Mohammed, who had taken the decision to leave or had had already left, we could try to dig into the more um, uh, complex matters. Uh, in, in, in the radicalization process, which is family, which is all the decisions that are, were made for Mohammed, bad decisions and, uh, for Mohammed and for Fatih as well, uh, all the pain and the psychological um, uh, conflicts that, that is within the family. So the, the radicalization is not just um, it's not just one thing. It's a whole complex of a lot of things that 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 we heard about before, also, and we wanted to to embrace that, and and uh, when we realized how much of a family drama that this was, we thought that maybe we can get the white Danish people to be interested in this subject, because a family drama, uh, a love story, everybody can relate to a, a young father who cannot see his son. Uh, and we we uh, were hoping that that would actually open up people's hearts to to embrace the complexity of the problem, because in Denmark, as well as in the UK, I think we have politicians and media that wants to portray this as a very black and white, uh, very simple matter. These guys are villains. They have renounced Denmark and the Danish values, and we don't want them back, no matter what. That, that's the official Danish uh, attitude towards them. And, and if we can, uh, with this film, just you know, scratch a little in that, in that very black and white and very uh, um, rigid way of looking at it, um, we, <laughs> we succeeded. <laughs>
Yeah, you I believe that because um, um, the Britons, they have just given him Al Shabaab and said, take this guy, we don't want him. And I believe that because um, they deport him because uh, he make maybe small drugs, and the way he told me is like about hashish or something like that, he make he smoke about it. And if I talk about his stepsister, she said about he be westernized. So, and if you talk about the system, they said he's religious. So everybody have something about Muhammad to talk about it. And that's why her, his sister did make a publication about the first time because he's westernized. She cannot control him. She cannot, he going outside and smoking weed and everything like that. She don't think he, he, don't, uh, he don't speak his own language. He don't know his own culture and religious. And that's why she don't think about it's her responsibility to talk about him. Definitely. Uh, please let me talk to you <laughs> about what is going on in Denmark. I have to stand up because, yeah. <laughs> because what is going on in Denmark uh, right now is that we have a government that has uh, implemented something they call a ghetto plan. They have pointed out these, I think it's 10, yeah, ten. Or yeah, ten, ten yeah. ghettos. Okay. That they are ghettos because there are lots of immigrants. There are a certain number of people with, uh, that have been in conflict with the law and there are a certain amount of people on welfare. So that's why it's, it's a ghetto. And when you live in that ghetto, you're subject, you're subject to more punishment if you do something, uh, a crime of some kind. You're subject to collective punishment if your son or daughter gets in conflict with the law. The whole family can be thrown out of the apartment. Uh, and, uh, and you're subject to a lot of other um, uh, restrictions that you are not in the rest of the society. And people who live in what we call the ghettos, there they, is a lot of immigrants. And it is a lot of people on what we would call it the, the, the underclass of Denmark. So what we are saying to them as a society is that you're not as wor worth as much as the rest of us. Can I call them this first language that is Danish, where they look browner than me yeah. and they can't get yeah. jobs. You know, they're 18, yeah. 17 years old, can't get yeah. jobs. They don't even, you know, they were born in Denmark. Exactly. And language is Danish, second Arabic, third English. Yeah. And so th this yeah. is one of the things that are happening in Denmark. Another thing is that, that the, the, the debate uh, and that has something to do with, you asked if, if Britain plays a role, the UK plays a role in the radicalization. It definitely does, because we, are, we, we have a society that, that, um, that isolates certain groups of people. Uh, and and, and uh, that isolation, which is both social and, and cultural, of course creates a need for belonging with, within those guys. Uh, I mean, of course, in, we all need that sense of belonging. We all long to, to belong to a group or to, to have some identity. And that's not the only, the only factor in this. There's a lot of factors. But, but I definitely think that our society, the Danish society, has a big role to play in the radicalization of these young men and women. But we don't want to recognize it. We don't want to look at it. We only want to point fingers at them and say that they have behaved badly, they have to go to prison, and when they have done their time, they get deported. That, that's, that's the way it goes on in Denmark. Proud of my country. <laughs> <laughs> so having come at it um, from a slightly different thing, I think if you will remember the, the human rights lawyer, and she's saying, you know, I'm a human rights lawyer, but there's not a lot of space here, because on paper, these are the processes. And I think that's some of the issues, that these are kind of like bureaucratized processes. And it's not that they don't or do care, it's that the processes are not about people. Mm. They're about the system and the numbers. And I think that really fits in uh, to the, the kind of way in which the human rights lawyer was trying to be sympathetic, mm. but the system doesn't mm. even allow her to do that. Um, so I, I think as well that looking at the local kind of bureaucratic decision making is, is really interesting seeing how you know, different lawyers and, and social workers or police try and work within the system, knowing that it's not perfect as well. Um, but I think as well, what we were saying before about place mm. and the importance of place becomes really uh, central to some of the stories. Like we think about radicalization as being, again, just about ideas, but it's very much about rooted in places and having those local connections and those networks and who happens to be 
in your space around you at that time? Who is the guy in the local kebab shop versus your KFC? And, and that's just about place and space and the network and the transport systems that you have. So uh, coming from, from Birmingham, uh, one of the key issues is around our transport system. So it sounds really mundane if you're talking about radicalisation processes. But actually, in Birmingham, you can get from the city centre to various parts of Birmingham quite easily. It's like a hub and spokes. Um, but what that ends up doing is you end up kind of like with a slice of cake around the city. And you have, here's the Somali section, uh, here's the Ethiopian section, next door is actually your Bangladeshi, and then your Pakistani, and then you usually end up with Polish and European, and you end up with this night. And there's some white people around the edges, by the way, um, and a few people in the concentric bit near Edge Baston, which is quite posh. And that's okay. But it's really difficult to physically travel around the city. You can go from the city centre out, but you can't travel around. So yes, it's a multicultural city, and I'm dead proud to be uh, living in Birmingham. It's a, an adopted home, and I really don't sound brummy, um, and that's okay. But that's the point, right? How do you travel? How do you make connections? How did Mohammed have any other choices? And in East London as well, how do you get across London? How do you make other connections? Who else is going to be in your world? Um, and therefore, I think it is about, yeah, what, what kind of society and how do we uh, work together to form that? There is a, a and, and um, uh, we're very proud of the Aarhus <laughs> model, as we call it. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk about it. And a, a number of kids have went through the program. How yeah. many is it? 57. Mm -hmm. To seven, From yeah, uh, ISIS groups, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's a it's a it's a what would you call it a niche thing, because it's it's much more political than that. Also, because we have a, we have an election coming up, which intensifies the 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 need for the politicians to be very law and order, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, like towards this this thing. So everybody has sort of forgotten everything about de-radicalization as a humanitarian thing, as, as a good thing. And, and the whole, also the government we have, they have, they have just uh, announced an, uh, a change of paradigm uh, regarding foreigners, uh, refugees and immigrants. Um, we always said that we need to be better at integrating people. Now they have, uh, they have, um, uh, implemented the, the other way around. We don't want to integrate people, we want them out. So I don't think anybody wants to talk much more about the Aarhus model no. <laughs> in Denmark because they actually, and they say it out loud, it's not, it's not uh, candid or anything. They want them out. And they even change the name of the, the welfare money that you get if you're a refugee to uh, home, sending. home sending money, mm -hmm. not to integration uh, money as it was used to call. So it's it's very obvious to everyone what, what, what is going on right now. For example, for me, it's, uh, and I believe that because in, I live in Denmark since I was 12 years old, and it's very hard for me. Still, I'm, I was trying. I'm not blowing still. I'm not Danish still. And if still, I'm, I'm going to the street. They will ask me, when you go home, why are you staying here? What are you doing here? Even I'm staying so long time, and I'm trying my best to be part of society, even if I go to the club in the night, I cannot come inside somehow because I have bad um, color or <laughs> bad, bad names, whatever they call it. So sometimes it's in, you feel like you don't belong to society because in Western society, it's not like, it's like just white people, not black people. You feel like you, you're trying your best everywhere and even if you're, if you're Muslim, you are, it's very hard also. So I think the society have to look about themselves and say, what are we doing about these young people and integrated or isolation or do we put them outside in society and they don't belong to them? The first question was the human story versus the system and do you think yeah. by moving away from forgiveness? Yeah. Um, I remember when we started this project, and, we, and when you do a project like this, you have to raise finance and uh, to be able to make the film. And when we talked to commissioning editors from, from uh, broadcasters all over Europe, and we, 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 uh, we found that we couldn't use the word forgiveness. 
because every time in the beginning when, when I was like a romantic, we, we have to talk about forgiveness. Every time we said that, they went dead in their eyes. There's no forgiveness. These, in their view, these people have renounced the values that we stand for. And, and there's no forgiveness. So we stopped using that word when we pitched the project because we could see that they were, they were, um, they were. They, we we made we pissed them off when we, <laughs> we say when we talked about forgiveness. They thought we were a couple of hippies, you know. So so um, there is there is a movement away from all that towards a more uh, almost biblical way of of looking at people who who um, who. Uh, who step, uh, who, who make the wrong steps, especially when they have another color and another culture and when they're Muslim. I think if, if there's polls right now in Denmark actually supporting the government's uh, harsh uh, line, but I think that that attitude among, among people in general is driven by fear, and that fear is fueled by the politicians and the media because they paint everything in black and white, good or bad. Um, th there are, there's no room for actually discussing our own part, uh, our own role in the, in, the, in, the, in the radicalization. And as long as we're not willing to do that, it's just those guys who are bad guys. And we are the good guys, you know? And that, that fear is, is, a, is a driver in, the, in Danish society right now. So I I find it difficult to disagree with the, everybody else who's spoken. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Try. something that I think that's important is that that idea of polarizing society, of driving politics through fear, is also what organizations like Al Shabaab want when they use mm. violence. It's about introducing a politics of fear. And so I think it is incumbent upon us all to resist the politics of fear no matter where it comes from, who, wherever the origin is. But the second thing is as well that organizations such as Al-Shabaab uh, also want to present this kind of very binary worldview, good guys, bad guys, it just mm. depends who the good guy is and who the bad guy is, depends on who's telling the story. But also they have this very singular idea of what the truth is, that there is one version of the truth and they have it, same too with politicians, they have the mm. version of the truth. And I think for a society that wants to, and I presume, resist radicalization of all sorts, is to kind of question this idea of there being a singular narrative or a singular truth or a singular counter narrative or a singular kind of answer to these problems. And what I actually want to thank the two of you for is not providing us with a neat, happy ending, mm. right? Too often we get these Hollywood endings that tell us, this is the story, here's your nice, neat story arc, here's your, your nice new myth. Mm -hmm. um, of the, the saved warrior, yeah. right? Yeah. And you didn't do that. No, no. And that, I think, is actually really powerful because it reminds us that actually our lives are best served in the kind of the complexity and the muddle and not trying to find the simple answers to things. And, uh, yeah, as, as uncomfortable as sometimes that mm. can be and as much as we want the Spielberg happy ending, um, I think our, our lives are better served. Um, and our responsibilities to both the victims of terrorism but also the people who are trying to exit those groups is about acknowledging that complexity and that diversity and those open-ended futures and not trying to say that's your future, this is my future and, and to keep those futures open um, and that's what I would hope for in a positive world. Well, we'll, we'll have to leave it there, guys. But um, as I said, yeah, if you have a question or something else you'd like to ask, uh, write it down. If you want to leave an email address, post the links, as I said. If it's to one of our panels specifically, uh, add their name and we, we will get back to you. Thank you all for coming and a big thank you, thank uh, you to our, our panel. Thank you. Thank you.